Hi, this is Kara Mayer Robinson. Welcome to Really Famous, where I talk to famous people and cut through the fluff to get to what they really think and how they really feel. My guest today is Dee Wallace. She played Elliot's mom, Mary, in one of my favorite movies, E.T. You may remember her in Cujo. She was in The Howling, The Frighteners, a bunch of horror movies. It's not like she's been hiding away over the years. She's been on TV in Grey's Anatomy and Grimm, Switched at Birth. She's in a series on Amazon. It's a kid series called Just Add Magic. And my nine-year-old and I really actually love this show. Dee is also in a movie right now. It's a horror movie and it's kind of similar to those old school horror movies that you probably haven't seen in a long time. It's called Red Christmas and it's an Australian film. She again plays the mom like a totally badass, kick-ass mom. You'll love her in this film. Again, that one's called Red Christmas. So I talked to Dee when I was in Los Angeles last month. Usually we record in New York, but I took a trip out to LA so that I could record a bunch of episodes with actors who are based out there. And I rented a little white car, slapped a really famous podcast car magnet on the doors, and drove all over those Los Angeles freeways to meet my guests wherever they happened to be. So I motored around with my little vehicle and pulled up to Dee Wallace's house, rang the doorbell, and she was exactly as I had hoped she would be. She opened the door with her dog and was super friendly. We sat down and got comfy and talked about a lot of things. She told me all kinds of stories about how she got into Hollywood. And it's really, um, it's an inspiring story. She came from Kansas, but I won't tell you that she will. So yeah, she told me all about how she moved from Kansas to New York and to LA. We talked about her career and she told me a lot of stories behind E.T. and Cujo. Uh, A lot of them surprised me. You'll hear stories about Steven Spielberg and what it was like for her or what it is like for her to be a mom in real life. Her daughter was also home that day and her name is Gabrielle. She's an actor as well. You can see adorable pictures of the two of them. They're like two peas in a pod on reallyfamouspodcast.com. And Dee also talked about a lot of personal stuff. She opened up a ton about the rough patches in her life when she was a child, when she got married. Um, There's, you know, a lot of stories in there and you'll hear them all. She even cries a few times. I'm not sure if you'll be able to hear that or not. Um, I don't know if it translates in audio, but she's really into spiritual healing. Dee is also a personal healer. So she has a practice where she talks to people and helps them figure out sort of like what their struggles are and helps clear the path so they can get to where they want to be. This is my description, but you'll hear her talk about it. She also talks about something called channeling, but I'll let her explain that. Before you listen in, number one, you may hear some panting in the beginning it's not D and it's not me. It's her dog, Freedom, who bonded with me right away and ended up just sitting next to me and putting her head in my lap as we talked. It was really cute. And a few people have asked me how they can support the podcast. I just set something up for like $3 or so. Head over to patreon.com. That's P A T R E O N. Com. I just signed up, added myself to their list so that anyone who wants to just throw a few pennies over, that would be amazing. You'll also get some nice rewards. There are all different levels of rewards. Of course, you'll get my sincere gratitude. I'll thank you personally on the show. That's right. I will mention your name, give you a nice shout out, and you'll get access to all kinds of exclusive content. So head over to patreon.com slash really famous or really famous podcast.com. I've got a button that will take you right to Patreon. We'll give you a big thank you for being one of the true fans of really famous. Here she is, Dee Wallace and me at home, her home, not mine in LA. Dee, thank you. You're welcome. 
I'm really happy to be chatting with you, and there's so much about you that I, I, I don't didn't really know. know, but I didn't know, that's it. <laughs> and I understand you are sort of like an, like an empowerment or a healing coach. What do you, well, what do you call yourself? Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a healer. I'm a clear audience channel. But I do it in, you know, hi, I'm the girl next door from Kansas, and this is our bullshit. <laughs> and uh, the longer I've done the healing work, which is 30 years now, um, the more I realize what I'm doing is teaching people to retrain their brain through spiritual language. What was your childhood like? Like, describe, set it up for me. Oh, my. My childhood was a perfect dichotomy of love and support and angst and uh, constant unknowing. My dad was an alcoholic uh, most of my life. Um, ended up committing suicide when I was a senior in high school. My grandmother pretty much raised me because my mom had to work. We were very poor. <laughs> And um, so there was this, I am the child of the quintessential yin and yang, mm -hmm. right? So your Positive, mother was... negative, um, uh, love, fear. Um, that's, that is the child of alcoholism is you're constantly, you know, looking to the left, looking to the right, looking, wh when's the other shoe going, am I safe, am I okay, is mom okay, or is my little brother okay, you know. So you're the oldest of two. I was the middle, but my older brother is seven years older, and uh, most of the time during those years, he was off to college and starting his adult life. And, and my little brother is seven years younger, so I spent a lot of my time at night taking care of him. He slept with me. Um, up in, in the sleeping porch was my bedroom and um, you know because I was trying to keep him away from the craziness that would always ensue beginning around 10 o'clock at night. So it was a definite pattern that was going on? Oh yeah. He well, drank at night? Yeah. Well he drank all the time. That's why we didn't have any money and my mother, God love her, and let me say this about my dad. He was, I get a lot of my creativity from him, though, also. Um, he was, you okay? Oh, I'm good. He was. If anybody hears panting in the background, it's, <laughs> let's yes, just have it's, a disclaimer. Yes, if, if anybody hears panting, it's my dog who's just in love right now <laughs> and getting stroked. And you should see her face. She looks like she's stoned. <laughs> Oh, she could sit here the entire time. I yeah. will be perfectly happy oh, okay. stroking her. Right. I didn't want her to Oh, no, no. Me. She can, believe yeah. me, the whole time she can put her head in my lap. I'm good. Come on. Oh, she's Lay okay, in. really. Um, so, so going back to what it was like in your household. So I know. I can This is what, but these are how the conversations, it's a natural conversation, right? Have you ever stopped in the middle of a conversation that you're having with anybody? Like, how did we even get to this? Yeah, absolutely. And it's like impossible to trace. It's just natural. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, okay, so getting back to Childhood. night, okay, so nighttime, 10 o'clock, things would get difficult. So, like, what, 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 what would happen? Well, you know, the yelling would start and, and the fighting would start and I'd go down and my lovely image for a little girl to have, my dad would be stark naked and very bloated by that time. Um, totally drunk, um, berating my mother, never hit her, but emotionally berating her and threatening her kind of with his body movements and stuff. And, you know, I would try to calm them down and calm him down and separate them and... Did, what, was that this effective? This every night of my life. How, but how much. could a child at whatever age that was, because it was your whole life, how could, did you have an impact? You can't, right? Like, how could you even have change? And like, you're trying to break things up or separate them, but did, were you successful? Um, yeah, oftentimes. Oh, because really? Because there was something still in there that registered I don't 
want my daughter to see this. So either my mom would disengage or we'd get him to bed. Um, and sometimes not. Sometimes I just have to give up and go back and shut all the doors and and take care of your brother. And take care of my little brother. So at that time, but you knew you were loved. You felt loved. Always. Always. I never ever felt unloved. I felt abandoned. But you can feel loved and abandoned at the same time. Who did you feel abandoned by? Oh, my dad, for sure. Your mom too, or no? Oh, never. Never. Never my grandma. I, I had such strong matriarchal women in my life and um, a strong church support. Um, we were very active in the Methodist Church. And um, my older brother actually was a minister for a while. And did he know everything that was going on? Um, he knew, but he was on the other side of the country. You know. And your mom was working as what? What did she do? She was a secretary. My mom was a saint. She was... I don't know how she did it. She would barter with this amazing ballet teacher that I studied with because we had no money to pay her for lessons. And my mother was an incredibly beautiful actress. She was actually my first teacher. And so she would write poetry and get out. We had no way to record it back then. So she would, she would go out and read these amazing things that she wrote in between the dance pieces for the recitals and everything and in exchange for lessons for me. So I was a trained dancer. I've actually uh, danced with a couple of ballet companies you have, in the uh, Midwest back oh. in my youth. Yeah, and um, and that's how I that's how I got my equity card in New York. Is the first thing I booked was the Milliken Show, which at that time was a multi-million dollar industrial show. What do you mean industrial show? An industrial show is like. A, uh, a lot of the big companies put on major musical, um, or used to, I don't know if they still do, major m musical productions like tie a yellow ribbon round a nose mobile. <laughs> I danced my way across the country for the Oldsmobile show. I went to... Oh, so they were um, like sponsorships yeah. almost. Well, and, and it was for their salespeople. Oh, okay. And so they would all come together for these huge weekend, you know, trainings and stuff, and this would be a part of. And you loved that at the time? Uh, uh, look, uh, I was from Kansas. I had just taught a year of high school and moved to Kansas by myself. And Wait, and moved to New York by yourself? Moved to New York, yeah. By and yourself, what was that like? You know, I was so naive. Uh, it was just a big, exciting, whoa, I'm going to be an actor, right? So It's like that, that dream. It's like that, that dream. something else, when I was teaching, um, we would get the New York Times in um, uh, the library at the school. Of, and there was a big article that Hal Prince, who's one of the biggest producers on Broadway, was looking for in Unknown to star in a little night music. So I wrote him and sent him the cheesiest picture, oh my God, cheesy picture, that one of my brother's friends who had worked on the school newspaper came over and took for me because I didn't have a headshot. So what was it, like a goofy, what, did you have a oh, goofy smile or something? I was going like this. It was so cheesy, I can't So you were like acting sexy or something? Yes, trying. <laughs> got it, got it. And I get this call from his 
assistant. But you wrote him a physical letter, like I a mail? I wrote him a physical letter, which was also quite cheesy, and said something like, I, I'm, you know, moving to New York and I'm from Kansas and I'm a, a dancer and an actress and just think what it would be like, you know, there would be some great press here, a new kid from Kansas. And I get a call from his assistant and she says, Mr. Prince would like to fly you to New York to audition for a little night music. Well, I had just bought a ticket because I was going to move to New York. And I said, oh, oh gosh, that's wonderful. When does Mr. Prince need me? Well, we need you at five o'clock on such and such a day. I went, oh my God, that's the day I arrive. I'm supposed to land at one o'clock. So that's great. You tell Mr. Prince he doesn't have to buy me a ticket. You know, <laughs> welcome to Kansas, you know, honesty and not Hollywood. You know, he would have flown me first class. Yes. I could have gone the day before, got some rest. A oh, nice hotel. No. So I take everything I have. I get off the plane. I go out to a cab. And I say, can you take these to this address? I've never been there before. It's my new apartment. Because I have to go to Rockefeller Center to an audition. Right. You're very trusting. Well, Kansas. Yes. But all my stuff got there. It did. You bet it did. <laughs> and I'm off to audition for Hal Prince, and I get down to the last five girls after the dancing and the acting. And then they say, Mr. Prince would like to hear you sing now. You didn't know how to sing. And I, I it didn't occur to me I had to sing. And I said to the lady running the audition, I said, oh, I, I didn't know we had to sing. And she looked at me and said, well, dear, it is a musical. <laughs> <laughs> so my first day in New York, I sang Happy Birthday for Hal Prince. And I played violin for years, but the accompanist said, what key, honey? And I said, somewhere in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever key you feel like, I'll try. But by the time I left there, I had met a lot of top gypsies, dancers, and found out somebody to study singing with, and um, gotten a lot of tips about being in New York. I mean, all of them were going, you, you flew in this morning? <laughs> Right? It's like, my God, how green can you be? But, but that I, was what he was looking for. Yeah. Right? Was, well, I think there was just something about the letter and the picture and everything that was just so kind of endearing and fresh sure. to him. Yeah. It's like, I can't quite believe this. Let's bring this girl in. You well, know? I think there's something endearing about you, too, naturally that I saw on screen, that you always see on screen, no matter what, what you're in. Oh, there thank is, you. But I'm sure that this is not the first time you've been told that. Well, I... Because I think that is the word. It's funny I when you say it. I think there's a truthfulness, you know. And when, um, when anybody ever asks me to do something not, that feels not truthful from the character, it's, it's just almost impossible for me. So you're in New York, and then what's going on personally for you? You're doing your Oldsmobile singing well, and dancing. Well, uh, okay, so I met a boy at a, an open audition. First of all, I went with $1,000, and I thought, oh my gosh, this, you know, I'll be able to live all year. <laughs> so four months later, I'm out of money. Um, my apartment was at 85th between 1st and York on the east side. It's a great area, an expensive area. Of course, I didn't know that. I, I rented it from Kansas. So I, I met a, a guy at an audition. He took me to a Halloween party. At the Halloween party, his agents were there. 
And at the end of the night, they said, you know, we'd really like you to uh, come see us on Monday. We think we'd like to work with you. And I went, cool, what do you do? And my date's like going, holy hell. Oh, no, who was it? And they were Marge Fields agents who were, Marge Fields agency was one of the top agents in New York. Uh, for commercials. So I went in and they signed me and just a couple of weeks later I went in for a United Airlines commercial and did this and made $28,000. So all you did, wait, you turned from, I'm trying to describe it, so you were like turning away and then you looked towards the camera, you turned your head. With with a smile. With a smile. I was the friendship girl. Remember United Airlines friendship girls, yeah. And how much did you make from that? $28,000. I thought I had died and gone to heaven. I didn't think I would, you know, I mean, from my coming from my family and it was like I had gone through another portal (laughs) into another universe, you know. But the the universe just kind of, uh, I tell great stories in my book, Bright Light, um, about how much I believe in naivete and how I would be in a coffee shop and the universe would go, here, you need to meet this person now. It was crazy. Yeah, that is crazy. That's one in a million. That's that's why I teach the healing work, because that's the way life's supposed to work. And then we get in the way. So without trying so much, without knowing too much, without trying to plot everything? Yeah, and, and trust. And without all of the preconceived fears and barriers that we learn to put up as as we go along. Yeah, that we're our own worst enemy in many ways. Yeah. Literally what goes on is there's a part of you that's saying yes and a part of you that's saying no. And until all of those parts are integrated into yes, then you have more struggle. As soon as all of you is is integrated together going, yes, I am doing that. I am going there. I am going to make it as an actress. Of course I am. So then what happened at that point? $28,000, you feel like you entered another portal. And then is it you're going into movies at that point? What's going on with your like love life? Is there a guy coming in? um, Well, this guy and I were, you know, together for the time I was in New York for most of that time. But um, I became the queen of commercials for the, that agency. I did a lot of commercials because at that time nobody wanted the ethnic. They wanted the fresh, blonde, Midwestern girl. And I just was there at the right time and I was the right thing, right? And I auditioned for some plays, studied with Uta Hagen. And that was like a big, uh, that opened doors for you. You know, the door it opened most of all for me is the exploration of myself and learning because ultimately Uta was not the right teacher for me. But learning that allowed me to understand my own instrument better. Uta and I, I mean of course I I learned a plethora in her class, but Uta broke everything down. She came from her head. It was all of a, um, I'm going to be very analytical about this and then I'm going to allow the embodiment of what I put together. I work That's not you. the other way. If my head gets involved, I'm dead. Okay. I'm just dead. It's like I can get to the end of a road and go, there's the hills, there's the sun, there's the ocean. Okay, so I have to go left. It's always right. If I just get to the end of the road and go, wow, let me feel which way I should go. It's always the right way. So at what point did you go to, did you get into films then? I'm making the, what, what you call the rounds, but you, it was impossible to get on the lots. You know, you, like today, you can't get through the lot unless you have an appointment or you're on the list. Or, so I did what any good Kansas girl does, I baked cookies. I baked homemade chocolate chip cookies and I wrapped them all up and tied them with big fancy bows. And I went 
to the gate at Universal and he said, hi, uh, I have deliveries. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, okay, and put me straight through. It's nice. So I'm taking my cookies around and as I'm leaving the cookies, um, with the assistant to Reuben Cannon, who is the head of casting at Universal. Reuben Cannon comes out and he goes, oh, chocolate chip cookies. And I went, hi, Mr. Cannon, I'm Dee Wallace and I just got here from Kansas and I'm an actress and I brought you some cookies. So you were really going with the Kansas thing well, too. You were like, much, I'm gonna say Kansas at my every- My people were from New York. They yes. were used to everybody coming out yes. from New York. But I really was still from very much from Kansas. So um, he said, well, come on in, talk to me. So again, you see, yeah, blind faith. So I go in and we sit down, we're having a nice conversation. He gets a phone call from the stage. The girl who was playing the waitress, who has six lines, is deathly ill and can't work. What do they want him to do? And I swear to God that he, he puts his hand over the phone and he says, what size do you wear? And I said, what size do you want? <laughs> he said, can you sit in a four, fit in a four? I said, you bet. I, I was a six, but I thought, I'm gonna get in that freaking costume if it kills me, right? So I did, and that was my first credit out here. What was that? It was a show, uh, a TV show? It was uh, Lucas Tanner. Okay. With David Hartman. And then a couple of weeks later, a friend of mine from New York, his best friend was directing Streets of San Francisco, and they needed a, this quote, a vulnerable girl who could emotionally get to a very high point within seconds. And he goes, oh my God, my friend Dee Wallace is out there, right? This is, so he just hired me. The director just hired me on the spot because I, I had to be raped. But it was this whole place, thing where the camera followed me like the rapist down the, you know, and it had to build and build and build and build. So, you know, what it takes some people 15 years to do, the universe kind of dropped in my lap. But I also baked chocolate chip cookies. Yeah, you, it, you right, know, right. It's, bo it's like both. Yeah, both it's things, both two ingredients both to make the whole. Both things have to come together, you bet. So soon you were on, so then one thing led to another, do, 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 do. Um, Within a little over five years, but between the time I left Kansas till the time I started in ET was about five and a half years. Wow, and then Crazy. ET, it blew everything up for you, I bet, right? Uh, of course, but I, I did a lot of work, you know. Yeah, you were ready. I, I, I was in, you know, I was in 10, Blake Edwards 10. Last girl to audition for the part, they couldn't find, um, Blake was looking for somebody to make the transition between this vulnerable little girl energy, she was a woman, but this little vulnerable energy, into um, this more mature woman that gets hurt within a few short hours of meeting this guy. And um, I had done a guest star on the Lou Grant show and played this amazing role of this hooker. I mean, it was one of the best roles I've ever had in my lifetime. And Lynn Stallmaster's office happened to see it that night and called my agent the next morning and said, I'm seeing the last round of girls today, can she get here? Now, thank God, I'm trained in um, a technique where you don't have to break it down, you don't have to stay a lot of time with it, you just jump in and she's there. You go and there, I yeah. just knew Mary Lewis. I just knew who she was uh, when I read it. And they, they booked me before I even got to my car. So how did, you, how did E.T. come, on, come about? Well, E.T. had, uh, Stephen had called me in and auditioned me for used cars 
which fortunately I did not get. Um, but he remembered my qualities. He was coming back to my quality again. Well, and, and Stephen wanted everybody in the film to be a child. He, uh, you know, you don't see any adult other than me in the film until they, until we get to the part where all the bad people come in. Yeah, because the adults are all bad. So he wanted you to be like a child, you mean? Yeah. Oh. And, you know, he said to me, you just have this vulnerability, D, and that's what I wanted. So when E.T. came along, they just called and offered it to me. Just like that. So you didn't even audition. Not for E.T. I had auditioned. Yeah, for used cars. For used cars. But, you know, Stephen is always working 10 years ahead, and he went, and that's the quality that I want. And it worked, and that was that. So that's interesting. I feel like there was one other adult, though, but he was a bad guy, too, like the teacher or something. Wasn't there the teacher with the frogs coming out of the... They were going to dissect the frogs yeah, in school. Yeah, but you never saw him. But you never saw the teacher? Oh, that's so cool. That's like Psycho. You think you saw the blood, but you didn't. The red blood. So it's the same kind of thing. You, really, there wasn't a teacher that we saw in that room? I don't think so. Oh, okay. Oh, God, I hope I'm right about that. Yeah, well, that. we can yeah. check on that, but that's ah. good. that is good stuff if that's the case, too. But, you know, the, the teacher uh, uh, that I talked to, it's, you know, and all that, well, gosh, is that even in there? Because um, Harrison Ford was like the principal that I came in to talk to. I don't even know if that scene. Wait, Harrison made it. Ford in ET? Yeah. Well, you never saw him again. Again, you never saw any of the adults. So that scene might have not even made it in. Are you saying that there was a scene that you filmed with Harrison uh -huh. Ford for ET mm -hmm. that was not in the film? Well, but he was never supposed to be seen anyway. Ah, just, so really, the, oh, that's so, I don't think that's a fact that many people know. That seems like a piece of trivia. Interesting, yeah. I like it. Maybe so, I could make some money, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> E.T., for me personally, I always mention it as one of my personal favorite movies of all time. Well, you're smart. It was something else. It's life-changing, still changing people's lives. I mean, radically changing people's lives. How do you mean? Well, like I had a mother come up to me at a personal appearance and she had tears streaming down her face and she said, "Miss Wallace, I just want you to know you are a part of a miracle in my life. My son's autistic. He was 10 years old. I had never heard him speak a word. And I took him to see the re-release of E.T. and on the way home he started saying every line that E.T. had said in the film. That film surpasses the heart connection and it reminds us of what we all know that if you're going to get back to the home of who you are you better keep your heart open which interestingly enough now is the basis of all my healing work so you know the universe conspires to bring it all together E.T. moves a lot of people. I'm telling you that I still cry every time I watch so it. So do I. I was watching it with my nine-year-old recently, yeah. and he looks over at me and he says, oh, mom, are you okay? I mean, every time, I know exactly what's happening. I know it's gonna happen. I've seen uh, it a million probably times. Probably 150 times yeah. I've seen it. I always cry. You cry every single time still? Every time. Incredible. We don't have to go through every film that you've ever been through. Oh, please. It would That's take forever. 180. Um, I'll ask you quickly about Cujo. Cujo is my favorite film. Why? Just because I feel like it asked me to go as far as I could go, and I did as truthfully as I could. Far in terms of what? Acting. As far in terms of um, truthfully digging into uh, every emotional moment and committing to it um, in as truthful a way as I could. You know, I didn't have children when I did E.T. I didn't have children when I uh, did Cujo. And people often ask me, gosh, how, could you, how can you play such a truthful mom when you didn't have kids? I said, well, I had a mom. I had a mom, and I know that connection. 
it's a I mean the connection I had with my mom and the connection I have with my daughter same connection yeah yeah unbreakable unbeatable I would lay down my life for either one of them it's it's really quite unexplainable a mother's love if you look at the the movie every scene is when do I break down? How much do I break down? Which way do I break down? Just physically. The challenge was the emotional and physical stability you had to have to do that movie. Um, just the hours we worked and the amount of emotional availability at every moment I was on set. I had to just open myself to the rawness of wherever I was going to go. Was it draining? Well, they treated me for exhaustion for three weeks after I finished. I'm still on adrenal supplements because I totally blew out my adrenals. Because this is another thing a lot of people don't know. Um, your body doesn't know you're acting. Your body goes through exactly the same fight or flight stuff as if you were really in trauma and and fighting for your life for the entire eight weeks that you're shooting. That makes sense. So my adrenals just blew. And they've never been the same? Never. Hmm. And fortunately I found a doctor because most doctors don't know anything about adrenals and my channel's telling me I should give you some definition of what that is because there's going to be listeners out there that are going to go, oh my God, I think that's me. So when your adrenals go, <clears throat> you're much more emotional. You get angry at the snap of a finger. And you, no matter even if you go, what am I doing? I don't want to do this. I want to be positive. You can't be. So those are some of, and you get very tired too when, when you have adrenal fatigue. So those are some of the, um, the warning signs, the danger signs of adrenal fatigue. And what happens is that mirrors, of course, depression. And that mirrors uh, emotional imbalance. It's physical, but it doesn't feel physical. And most doctors don't know anything about adrenals, and so they will put you on antidepressants for the rest of your life. Is that what someone tried to do with you? Uh, no. I went to a chiropractor who said, you know, Dee, this isn't normal the way your body's reacting. And I had told him, you know, it was not too long after uh, Cujo. And uh, he said, you know, I, I know this doctor, and he's a Sikh doctor, um, and he's a licensed internist, but he deals first in homeopathy. And um, I went to him because my neck and back felt like they were in a vice and I couldn't move them. So what else I had gotten on Cujo was Coxsackie disease. So was which that like is a virus or something? Coxsackie is a virus and it's basically hoof and mouth. We were working on a ranch. Oh. We were working around all the diseases that ranch, and, and it's a virus, and I got it. And so the first trip to this doctor, uh, he found the Coxsackie. I was out of pain for the first time in probably three months, and he discovered my adrenals. So what did he do, like medication or something? Yeah, homeopathic medication for, um, 
for the Coxsackie and adrenal supplements and B12 shots and stuff to get me back. And what was going on personally at that point? So you said you didn't have kids then. Were you married or? Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was married um, when we did ET, we bought this house. Oh, this is the ET house. This is the ET house. And, um, and Christopher Stone, who was my husband for 18 years till he passed away, did Cujo with me. He played my lover in Cujo. I know why that was your husband? Yeah. Okay. He also played my husband in The Howling. So we worked together quite a bit, especially for Dan Blatt. Dan loved, Cujo, uh, loved Chris. So, so where was I going? So I asked you if you were married at that point. You said you were. Mm -hmm. no, no kids. kids. No kids. So, but we were trying. It. I tried for six years. We tried for six years to get pregnant, and every specialist in LA said, you know, I don't. I don't know. We don't know what the problem is. And finally, this last doctor we went in to see, and he said. Uh, I'm sorry to tell you this, Mrs. Stone, but uh, I don't think you're ever going to get pregnant. And Chris dropped his head into his hands, and he looked at him and said, I'm really sorry, Mr. Stone. And he, Chris looked at him and he said, oh, no, it's not that. You just should never have told her she's never going to get pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, you know, God and I have a different plan, but thank you very much for your vote. So it took me six years, but I brought her in. <laughs> you did it. There she is, right over there. She's an actress, and she just wrote and directed and starred in her first short film that's winning a lot of awards. What's it called? It happened again last night about uh, spousal abuse and how it's passed down. There's also a lot of uh, LGBT messages in there. And what's her name? Gabrielle Stone. Six years, it happened, and then how did life change for you? Mm -hmm. Or didn't it? Um, well, if anything changed in my life, it certainly wasn't my career, it was my daughter. How? Um, I don't even know how to describe it. Just everything. My whole, um, you know, you think you know what love is, but you never know what love is till you look at your baby. I mean, I look at this baby and I can feel love, my little doggy. <laughs> but, but thinking about that her. connection that I have. We were laughing the other night about this amazing connection we have. And she said, Mom, do you think any other mother and daughter has a relationship, anything close to ours, because we work together and she does the healing work with me? And, um, um, she right now is going through a divorce. They were only married two years and he was having an affair on her. And um, so she's moved back in here with me. And oh, that's awful. And, um, but she, you know, I've taught her well and she's one strong broad. And she said, look, we didn't have kids. Thank God we didn't have kids. So they, and we didn't have a lot of belongings together. So there's a lot of blessings here, Mom. You know, but I was in her room when, when um, one of her friends called and she said, oh my God, you know, how's your mom taking this? You know, basically is your mom upset and does she want you to stay, try and work it out and all this? And Gabrielle said, hell no, my mom's been through it, she's gone through it, her mom helped her get out of her first marriage. <laughs> my mom and I are like mirrors, you know. My father died 
her dad died when she was seven, uh, Christopher. I, it's it's almost bizarre how our lives. So your dad died when you were a teenager, right? Yeah, my dad died when I was almost seventeen. And her then, died. Dad died when she was almost seven. And how did Christopher die? Heart attack. That must have been tough. And she found him. She did. I was in. I had just sent her and our nanny back from New Zealand because I was shooting the Frighteners down there. And um, she had asked him to go play baseball. That was their thing together. And he had the heart attack at the uh, at the field. And fortunately, my nanny had gone with him, so Kristen took him to the hospital. And he actually died. They revived him. Um, I flew back for the angioplasty, which was a success. And they were holding filming for me, and he said, you know, Pepper. That was it, my nickname. Pepper? Pepper. Pepper. Um, I'm fine. Go. So I flew back to, you know, it's halfway across the world. Four days later, I get a call that an aneurysm had hit his heart, and he was gone, and Gabby had gone in to get him up and found him. So I flew back again, and we did his service, his party. We had a celebration of life party. And I flew back again with uh, Gabrielle and my nanny and finished the shoot. How did you get through that time? I don't know. I really don't know. I think it, it was my work ethic that I was taught by my mom. I, I didn't know where I was, really. Um, I went right to the set and I had to do the scene where um, I shoot Michael J. Fox and I remember doing that scene and sh seeing Michael and shooting Michael and seeing Chris hit the floor. That's how in and out of reality and worlds I was. You know, and I would come off and they would give me homeopathic medicine. They sent me to this amazing doctor. See, again, the universe conspiring about what was coming up in my life. Sent me to this amazing um, doctor who literally took one look at me and she said, you have no life force left at all. See? And so she would, she played place stones on all my chakras and uh, did some energetic work on me and I thought I'd been reborn by the time I left that office. And did it stick with you, that feeling? Well, I had my energy, you know. I didn't make everything go away and no, but at least I could finish the shoot. I had my balance back. And how did you deal with the emotional aftermath after the shoot was over? The year, the well, two years? Well, walking back into this house was tough, really tough. But, you know, um, for her. And you had to be strong for her, just like my mom had to be mm -hmm. strong for me. And you said your, so your mom helped you get out of your first marriage? Yes, I, uh, my first marriage, I... Uh, well, he's still alive, so I want to be careful. There were irreconcilable differences that my mother said, oh, you can't spend the rest of your life, you know. You, you can't spend the rest of your life in, in, in a marriage where this is going on, as good a man as he was. And so she went to court with me and had it annulled. Now, for a mother to do that in Kansas in the 60s Major. took a lot of balls. Yes, well, your mother had a lot of balls. She had a lot of balls and passed them on yes, to me. Yes, to you and, and I have to passed Gabrielle. them on to Gabrielle. You bet. Yeah. So, well, Gabrielle is how old now? 
28. She's 28. Okay, so we've got some years, though, between then and now. Um, well, so I was acting in some good years, some bad years. Um, I started my acting studio to supplement my income because I wasn't working enough. But again, um, I truly know that that acting studio was created so that I would create the healing work. I know that you have a, a, like a big umbrella of healing work that you do, right? So uh -huh. you've written books, uh -huh. you do private sessions. I do, every you day. You speak. I do. You have a radio show. I do. Tell me about life as a healer. You know, it's just something I do. And I'm, I'm able to go, I kind of like live in the channel. Like a lot of me, a lot of this interview has been in the channel. But, you know, I don't use a weird voice or my eyes don't go back in my head. Or What do you mean it's in the channel? Um, I'm just connected to, you know, I'm not thinking about the answers. I'm not thinking about, oh, what's this going to sound like in a pot? I'm just channeling the truthfulness of what you asked me, which is what I do in my acting. And um, So it's like authenticity and truth that just comes and that you don't stop from coming by thinking too hard about it. Oh, you can't think at all, really. And um, what I'm... <laughs> well, all right, so let me explain what just went through my head. So I started saying what I'm really brilliant at and then I stopped me and I went, well, that sounds kind of <laughs> egotistical. And the channel said, you and I are the same thing, Dee. That's what just happened in those few brief moments, right? What I'm really, I, my channel, are really brilliant at is being able to reach into someone's energy and put together the pieces of why they're in their way, what the fears are, what age it went back to, um, the highest understanding of all of that so that really in a 50-minute session and I hear this all the time oh my god I got more out of this than 20 years of therapy so somebody will come to you so they come to you regularly like once a week I, or no well some people are on a, a monthly subscription so okay. they have one every month for a year so what that's happens? my best deal okay um, um, you meet do they come here to your house uh, some come in person mostly I do it over the phone okay because I have clients in Canada and Australia and New Zealand and you know Japan so what England. will a session be like like what would what what happens what happens is tell me what you want to know and you start talking, and I start channeling. Tell I work me. with a pendulum. What is that? What do you do with it? Well, so yeah. this is my pendulum. Okay. A pendulum. All right, so let's describe the pendulum. It is like a teardrop. Oh, well, um, it's a stone, stone on the end of a chain. You know, you can use your necklace. You can use a pencil at the end of a string. It's. It doesn't have any power in its own it's like a telephone if you think of it as a telephone that's the best because you just are it's helping open your channel and connect with energy so and where did you learn to use that uh through a doctor that i studied with you were trained like officially trained in something or? um no i wasn't trained in my healing work the healing work was given to me so you see the pendulum <laughs> the pendulum will move according to your thoughts. So you have to be focused and clear on the intent of what you want to ask. So show me my yes. See, it starts to get, as soon as I have the thought, show me my yes, it starts showing. That's my yes, show me my no. Goes the opposite way. Right, so when you were saying show me my yes, it was going around in a circular motion, uh -huh. and then you said show me my no, and then it started going back and forth. <laughs> Well, it was changing, but my no is a circular motion the opposite oh, way. Oh, okay, so clockwise Show or counter. Show me my maybe, that's the up and down. So you have a sheet of paper and it has different... 
Well, these are my sheets that have been compiled over almost 30 years now. And so you've these compiled? These are all channeled information. Ah, so you hear things and then you somehow your finger or your eye goes to one of them no, specifically I'm, sometimes? No, I ask. And they said, go to uh, sheet one, number four. Really? Yeah. Okay. Oh, it's unbelievable. I can pick up a book um, that I haven't read. And they'll direct me to a page and a paragraph, and it's exactly the piece of information we're looking for. It's really cool. Do you know anybody else who, who has the same experience? I've a lot of people. To do the same thing? Oh, yeah. So some of your sessions are for, or kind of to serve the purpose of somebody, what they're looking for, or trying to figure Stop out, it. but others are to teach them? Um, I, would, I would have sessions with people to teach them. Um, but usually when people make a, a, a private session, it's to get discerning information about what they are trying to learn. And what are, they, what are the, some of the things that you've heard over the years that they have realized or opened up? Oh, good God. Like, I, I, I seriously, I don't even know where to begin. You know, like I worked with a girl in New York who... Um, was a spokesperson model and she had um, had these huge contracts, $200,000 contracts, but she hadn't worked like, she says, D, I get callbacks and everything, but I haven't booked for like over a year. And I said, well, that's, that didn't make any sense. You know, and what it came down to, to make a long story really short, is the channel led us to the information that whenever she was in a committed relationship, her work fell off. And as soon as she would get out of that relationship, she'd work again. So, you know, she looked at me and said, but I, I want to work and I love this relationship I'm in. I don't want to have to give this relation. I said, well, now you can say, okay, I'm ready to have both of them. And it went back to her dad and, and what um, her dad had modeled to her when she was little. And, you know, sometimes uh, our perceptions are truthful. Most of the times we have put together things that don't even go together that create us holding on to uh, incorrect belief systems. You know, like you're walking down the street and you love fall. It's a beautiful fall day and you're looking at all of the incredible leaves and, and uh, Rottweiler jumps out in front of you and looks like he's gonna attack you instantaneously you have a connection between feeling good about fall and fear you know uh, after Chris died um, every October I would uh, he died in October and every October I go I'm not feeling so good I got a lot of into I wonder if I've got heart stuff going on and the third year my heart specialist looked at me and he said, D, do you know every October you come in with this? Why every October? And I went, oh my God. It makes perfect sense. But that's how we limit ourselves. And that's how we start looking at the world through glasses that aren't truthful colors. So do you ever find yourself slipping into ways of thinking that aren't... Oh, hell, every day. Like how? Oh, every day. Like what? Well, like the other day there were two or three, th especially when you're working through your big stuff, right? So, and again, back to my connection with my daughter. And I said, I, I went in and she said, oh my God, what's wrong? And he said, I don't understand why I'm being disrespected. You know, I, I'm so done with this. What's going on? And she looked at me and she said, Mom, how much do you respect yourself? And I went, 
I think I respect myself. And she said, really, every time somebody comes in and they go, oh my God, D, you're so beautiful, you deflect it. Oh my God, look how, what great shape you are, you deflect it. Do you ever sit down and think of thousands of people you help every day, Mom? Taught her well. And I went, yeah, I, I'm, walk, I'm not walking the talk. Uh huh. So you were feeling disrespected, but really she was showing you that you were, giving, you were disrespecting yourself despite well, the respect the you were getting. Well, the world can only mirror what you're holding within you. So, it, you know, Henry Ford, if you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Yes. Because the world will mirror what you think of you. The business, too, that will knock you down, right? Like, how do you. A hundred times a week. Right? Well, if you let it. It's a tough one. Well, if that's your perspective, it's pretty, been pretty good to me. I mean, it has sure. Been. Every, every actor, every person has ups and downs and good days and bad days, and you're in and you're out, and you come back and then you're gone, and you know. But again, I am the power that chooses and creates the love, the joy, and always the choice. So if I think I have to get hired and um, get a certain amount of money and everything to be honored, to be respected, right? If I take my self-worth off of what the world gives me, then I'm not in charge of my own creation. Yeah, it's totally external. And then you are reliant on that. And then you're screwed. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. (laughs) You're screwed. And then you wonder why the universe keeps not giving you what you want. Mm Mm-hmm. So, and you are getting nice things now. I'm going to bring this back to Just Add Magic, Uh if you don't mind. Sure. I like that show. It's a really well done. It's a family show. It's on Amazon. Amazon Prime. You just filmed another season of it? Uh, Actually, we're, yes, we're finished the first week of September. Oh, so you're filming right now. And how's that going? Well, you know, it's it's mixed because we know we're coming up to the um, uh, to the end of what we're doing, you know. And so again, there's that yin and yang. We're most of us, I think, are really happy to move on. Okay. And we've been really happy to be there. You know, uh, for me, I'm. Uh, feel very fortunate to have had the consistency of work that I've had. It's a beautifully done show, beautifully acted show, and I need more challenge. I I love to scream and cry and carry on and do all that emotional mm-hmm. stuff, mm-hmm. you know. You've got it in you and it's nice yeah. to be able to do that. Yeah. And so I I have some films coming out that I got to go do. I saw it. You saw Red it. Christmas. You saw yes. it? Yes. How did you see That's it? That's where I was going next. I saw it. I got a screener ahead of time. It's not out yet, I know. Do we know the release date? So that I, I will tell everybody in the no. intro. So I'll, I'll let everyone know when they'll be able to see it. But I saw it already. You little sneak. You've seen it too, right? Yes. Oh, course. okay. Yeah. And what do you think? Well, what do you think? I liked it. I loved it. So, but you know, it, you again. know, and we they did it on a shoestring. And when they sent me the script originally, I went, "Oh my God, I don't know if physically I can do this anymore." You, well, you did. You definitely but could I'm physically definitely do gonna it. Try. Yeah. Well, you succeeded. I'm gonna say. Um, thank you. Was it hard to do it physically because you were? This is a different era. Um, you know, Cujo was a long time ago. Well, and Cujo compared to this was still only because, you know, I would go, you know, this, it'd be a lot better here, Craig, if, if I fell into the room and did a roll and stuff and started shooting from the floor and Craig looked at me and went, can you do that, Dee? Do you want to, I don't want you to get hurt. Can, 
you know. So I got a few bruises and bangs and stuff, but nothing. I've always done my own stunts as much as they'll let me do them. I did all my own flying in uh, the Frighteners and and um, so because I've always been pretty physically fit. I, I don't think I could do Cujo again. I don't know. Well, that was tough even then. Oh, my God, you have no idea. And I'm so proud of my work in it. And again, I, I love Red Christmas because it, it's such a unique horror film. It has so many social commentaries about different things in it. And, um, and it was just, you know, we would work good hours, but the stress factor is so much less than it is here. You know, I have um, worked with guys uh, recently that literally are on the set 16 hours a day. Yeah, yeah. You can't have That's a like life. unsustainable. Or if you do... It's unsustainable yeah. and it's not good for your health, mm -hmm. not good for your psyche. Why do we think we have to do that? Balance. Um, yeah, I demand of myself balance. Yeah, and... I, I'll, I, I'm up at 7.30 and Ashley is my new assistant. She says, you know, it's just remarkable to me how many things you juggle, the how many things you have going on. And I, I'm very willing to spend the whole day focused on what I need to do. But man, at six o'clock, unless I have to have a personal appearance or something, I'm done. I'm ready for dinner with my boyfriend or my daughter. Give me my glass of wine. Want to go to a movie, want to sit here and watch a Netflix, you know. I've got to have that that, that decompression that, time. That balance, uh -huh. yeah. So what are you watching on Netflix? Do you have some favorites? Oh, House of Cards is, I adore House of Cards. I could watch Kevin Spacey till I die. Um, you know, and on network, I like um, Designated Survivor, although I'm so weary from what's really going on in our country that it's hard to watch almost anything political. You know, I saw an interview with Kevin and he's going, who could possibly have guessed that our ridiculousness would actually, would actually be, be happening mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. our world? So I've got a, an offer for a film that starts the day after I finish shooting Just Said Magic. Perfect, so, what kind of film? Um, it's a horror film, a really awesome character. Cool. Awesome, challenging, weird, freaky lady that I love to play. I found out it's not as much fun playing myself. So this it's person is not... It's a lot more fun to play characters like the Frighteners <laughs> than it is to play somebody who's close to me uh, with really simple material. Like who would be close to you that you played? Well, I think Mary in E.T. was very close to me, but there were amazing scenes in E.T. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't really Yeah, fall it's into not that simple thing either yeah. as much. Yeah, but I've played a, you know, a lot of moms that are just there. Yeah, yeah, just moms. Just yeah. good moms. Which is important for a project, but not terribly challenging yeah. for the actress. Not as much fun. And there's a boyfriend, you said, in the mix? I do have a be boyfriend, yes. Would you what want to expand on that? Not particularly. <laughs> He's an electronic engineer, and um, he, he just doesn't really understand all my healing work, but supports it and has studied it. And, um, you know, he's here a few days a week, and we have a great time, and he's a rock. I give so much to so many people, and he just gives to me. So there's a healer for the healer. Yeah. And we all need that, by the way. Yeah. Okay, so I have one last question for you. Okay. Um, yes, I like sex. <laughs> oh, no, that wasn't it. Okay. You can answer that one, too. <laughs> Who? It's two parts. Who do people think D. Wallace is? The mom in E.T. You said that so quickly, like you didn't even have to think about it. Well, not Don't that you think about, about it. Anyway. about it. 
What? I didn't have to think about it. You didn't have to think about it. That's It's that obvious. And that is a lot of who D. Wallace is. And the other part of D. Wallace is, fuck you, don't fuck with me. <laughs> and, and, you know, my kids would laugh in my acting studio um, because it really is... I don't know, can I say the F word? You oh. can. It really is that... What I perceive as a very balanced um, wholeness of God and fuck. I'm real, and I'm down to earth, and I'm tough love, and I absolutely know that there's a higher power that we are, and that we are a part of, that's running the show. But God helps him who helps himself. So the trick is to, and that's the name of my first book, Conscious Creation to create yourself consciously in every moment so that the universe can come help. Okay, I'm going to ask you one other oh, question separate. Oh, you liar! You liar! Because <laughs> you made me think of something different. What is something about you that people would never guess? Most people don't know. Uh, you see from the interview, yeah. I'm just such yeah you're not hiding anything an, an open book but i i think most people um wouldn't think that i'm still afraid and of course i'm still afraid we're in embodiment and that's part of being in embodiment is feeling that fear of separation and you know at this age do i find myself having moments of fearing death Absolutely. Even though I know we go on, I talk to so many people on the other side, there's not a doubt in my mind that, you know, when the body falls away, you just become part of the energy again until you want to come back into embodiment. There's not a doubt in my mind, like there's not a doubt in my mind that there are extraterrestrials. I've just dealt with too much energy to even doubt any of that stuff. And do I ever want to leave my daughter? Never. So yeah, I feel fear. And then you become consciously aware of that and you go, well, what, do you, what do I want to do with it? I want to know that I never leave her. My body might. But I'm never leaving her. That's our belief system. And as you believe, it's delivered unto you. Mm. You have to be conscious of choosing the thoughts around it and the reality around it that you want. You're good at that, so. I'm good at it every once in a while. I would like not to be tested quite so much. Yeah. You know, my mom used to say, you know, because her mom, my grandma, was a Southern Baptist, and she used to say, Grandma used to say to me all the time, you know, God never gives you more than you can handle. And I used to say to her, I wish he wouldn't trust me so much. <laughs> So you see, there's the dichotomy, again, of the realness and the spiritual and the... I think people in the spiritual world over the years have been way, way, way too woo-woo. Really, what spiritual people have been teaching without even knowing it is how to retrain your brain. That's what we do. I think it's like, ooh, we're... We're spiritual teachers and, you know, you can't understand it and, you know. Uh, oh, like mystifying it too yeah, much. Yeah, 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 yeah. Instead of going, no, you're your own God. Nobody can think a thought for you that you don't want. Nobody. So wake up and choose what you want to think and choose who you want to be and choose what you want to create and get going. If you have to bake cookies, bake cookies. <laughs> that says know? it all. <laughs> Dee, thank you so much. Oh my, what an interview.
If there's anything they don't know about me, I give up after this one. <laughs>